Uh, tonight, the focus of our evening is going to be on the Juan Wesley School, and I'll say another word about that in just a moment. Um, and a last, just a preliminary word is uh, just a reminder again that for this mission trip, we have the opportunity to give an offering. And in a few moments, I will drop uh, the advance number and the mailing address once again for the advance in the chat. So if you've been prayerfully considering an offering and need that information, we'll, we'll provide that for you again so that maybe you and your church can uh, give an offering to the mission in Honduras uh, while uh, as a part of your virtual mission trip. All right, so as I said, tonight, um, the focus is the Juan Wesley School, but before um, we dive into that topic, uh, we have with us a special guest, Bishop Michael McKee. I think I shared on the first night that beginning in 2019, Bishop McKee became officially the Episcopal leader for the mission in Honduras. Uh, he and I have traveled to Honduras several times, and, uh, and the bishop, um, well, he'll say more, of course, uh, on his own, but I know enjoys that role and that connection with uh, the mission and the people in Honduras. So he wanted to jump on one of our calls and, uh, and bring greetings. So Bishop. So thank y'all for, for being on the call over the last several nights. And thank you for your interest in, uh, in the mission in the Honduras that you have. Of course, I know that many of you have traveled with Andy and me to Honduras on, on an occasion or two, and uh, we're deeply committed to this work. And I want to thank you for your interest in it as well. So what's interesting is, is that um, I think the, the laity and the clergy of the, of the Honduras mission are, are very interesting, deeply committed people and doing significant ministry and some, and some challenging circumstances. We've enjoyed the friendships that we've made. And of course, we're wanting to encourage many others to uh, form those kinds of friendships too. It's not, there are things about, many things about ministry and the work of Christ that, that are done in Honduras that frankly, I think we can all learn from. And I think that's the value of mission is the sharing of assets, the sharing of things that, of things that we know. And so um, one of the saddest things is in the last year is that uh, I have been able to be in Honduras because of the pandemic and other things of that nature. I hope to go soon, but I think we're still some time off. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, we're going to have a, a meeting in the Honduras mission, the clergy and pastors, uh, the clergy, and I think laity, I'm unsure, uh, on a Saturday in May, and um, we're arranging for that so that we can uh, announce the appointments and things, things of that nature and take care of some business. So those of you who are from Honduras and are on the call, I just wanted to let you know of that. So thank you. Blessings on all of you uh, for sharing in this work that we do with our friends in Honduras. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bishop. Um, so I believe uh, looking at the call, Pastor Jamalith, do you have our opening, opening devotional or opening prayer tonight? Hey. Gracias. Así que vamos, bendiciones a todos. Vamos a leer la palabra de Dios en esta hermosa noche. La encontramos en el libro de Salmos, capítulo 100, versos 1 y 2. Así que la leemos en esta tarde. Bendice alma mía Jehová. Y bendiga todo mi ser su santo nombre. Bendice alma mía Jehová. Y no olvides ninguno de sus beneficios. Palabra de Dios. Oramos. Amado Dios. Una vez más nos acercamos ante ti. Con corazones agradecidos. Sinceros. Humillados. Y llenos de gratitud. Gracias por este tiempo en el cual compartimos 
los unos con los otros. Tiempo de reflexión. Tiempo de pensar en nuestra visión. Tiempo para hacer establecer tu reino aquí en la tierra. Una vez más, Señor. Te pedimos tu dirección durante este tiempo. Y todo lo que vamos a hacer. Todo lo que esté en nuestros planes. Sea conforme tu voluntad. Te pedimos tu bendición en este tiempo. Y que nos dirijas en nuestros pensamientos. Bendice, oh Dios, a cada uno de los que estamos reunidos. Gracias porque hasta este momento podemos decir, Ebenezer, Ebenezer, hasta aquí nos ha ayudado el Señor. Amén. Amen. And thank you, Pastor Jamila. So the Juan Wesley School, we're going to see a few videos. Um, one, an overview. We'll hear a witness or testimony from a student and also from a parent. Um, as we watch the videos, uh, be jotting down questions, put those in the chat. Um, we have with us tonight Cheryl McMorris, who is a uh, part of the staff team at Church of the Resurrection, and she uh, is closely connected to the Juan Wesley School and uh, coordinates the student sponsorship program, among other things. And so, um, so she will be with us to respond to those questions um, about the school. Before we see the videos, um, I just want to share two quick things about the Juan Wesley School. Uh, the first is that on one of my first visits uh, to Honduras, uh, the team I was with made the uh, one hour or so, maybe a little over an hour uh, drive from the capital city in Tegucigalpa to uh, Ciudad España, where the school exists. Um, and uh, we had a tour and we uh, met with the administration, but the real joy of that visit was uh, seeing the children. On that day, there was, ha there was some kind of a fiesta and a huge number of the elementary and middle school age children were gathered all together with their teachers um, on a, under a paved and covered pavilion in mean, a wonderful recreational space. And um, most of the teachers were wearing colorful silly hats. Uh, many of the children had fun costumes on. They were playing games and laughing and just having a wonderful time. And you could just see uh, the sense of community and joy that uh, had been developed there in the school. Um, I mean, that experience alone uh, left me with a really wonderful feeling about the ministry that happens in that place. The, the second um, point of contact that I've had with the school is that uh, my, my family has sponsored a middle school student uh, for the last two years. And you'll hear more about this, but the student we sponsored uh, is one year older in school than my daughter. And uh, they're both in middle school. And so a part of the program is that they trade letters. And so they, they write back and forth and talk about um, their interests, you know, the foods they love to eat, the books they're reading, uh, the, the ways they spend their free time the things they love about school and maybe the things that drive them crazy about school. And, uh, and they've been, you know, pen pals in that really, really wonderful old sense of that over the last couple of years. And, um, and again, I know that's been uh, deeply meaningful to me, but even more so to my daughter as she's gotten to see, um, you know, another country and just a school experience through the eyes of a, of a peer, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away across borders. And uh, so I've been so grateful for, for that experience, for her and the opportunity we've had 
uh, to come alongside one of the students there at the Juan Wesley School. So, uh, I mean, I definitely come as an advocate and I'm really thrilled for y'all to uh, learn more about the school tonight. So we're gonna start with a video uh, recorded by um, a person named Amanda and uh, let me share my screen and this will give you, tell you the story of the school and give you a good feel for it. Iglesia Metodista Unida, Cristo Resucitado, en la comunidad de Ciudad España, Honduras, presenta, en Dios haremos proezas, Él hoyará a nuestros enemigos, Salmo 62. La Iglesia Metodista Unida, Cristo Resucitado, está ubicada entre las comunidades de Agua Blanca y Ciudad de España. Los constructores de este hermoso edificio diseñaron este lugar pensando en que aquí, ocurrirían cosas maravillosas. Con la llegada de una nueva familia pastoral, encabezada por el pastor Daniel Trujillo, la iglesia local comienza a hacer cambios importantes en beneficio de la comunidad. Una clínica médica, un consultorio de atención psicológico gratuito, donación de alimentos y leche para las personas más necesitadas y muchas cosas más. Todo aquello acompañado del Evangelio de Jesucristo. El pastor Daniel identifica una gran falta de atención educativa en los niños y jóvenes, pues la única escuela pública es insuficiente para atender a todos los educandos de la comunidad. También hay una pequeña escuela privada, pero la mayoría de las personas son de bajos recursos. El pastor se da la tarea junto a su esposa, hijos y hermanos de la iglesia a realizar una encuesta y un estudio socioeconómico en la comunidad. Es así como prepara y presenta el proyecto para fundar una escuela cristiana sin fines de lucro. Después de muchísimas oraciones, ayuno, trabajo, lágrimas y de tocar puertas en compañía de Dios, y con el apoyo de un gran equipo, con personas como el pastor Juan Guerrero, la hermana Alessandra y otros miembros de la misión en Honduras, hermanos de la iglesia local y sobre todo el apoyo de la iglesia de la resurrección, se funda el Jardín Escuela Metodista Juan Wesley, iniciando su matrícula el 6 de enero del 2014. Se inaugura oficialmente el 18 de enero de ese mismo año, con un lleno total. Todos los que estuvimos ahí, fuimos testigos del inicio de una de las mejores instituciones educativas y la primera escuela metodista en Honduras, llevándonos a tal nivel de estar en el mapa mundial de las escuelas metodistas. Fue un día inolvidable. En el transcurso del primer año escolar, el pastor nota que los niños de la iglesia continúan en la escuela pública, en su mayoría. El motivo, la falta de recursos económicos. Qué triste que muchos niños de la escuela dominical querían estudiar en la metodista, como le llaman los habitantes a la escuela, pero no podían pagar, así que el pastor y su esposa deciden patrocinar a la primera niña con fondos de la clínica médica, a Evelyn Jerezano Carías, hoy una de las graduandos 2020. El comienzo de un nuevo reto, y el pastor Daniel lo asume, así que prepara el proyecto y comienza a tocar puertas otra vez, todo para beneficio de los niños y jóvenes con menos posibilidades de una educación de calidad. Los hermanos de Cor Dicen presente y se crea el programa de becas Cor Honduras en 2015, recibiendo la primera visita oficial de patrocinadores el 8 de enero del 2016, fortaleciendo aún más la escuela. En el mes de enero de cada año, los padres que desean una beca 
deben llenar una solicitud con sus datos personales y los del niño. El pastor local hace las entrevistas. De ahí se identifican los casos reales y se aprueban según la necesidad y la cantidad de cupos disponibles. En el año 2017 se amplió el programa con una beca asistencial, esta vez para universitarios. El pastor Daniel identifica la necesidad de apoyar a los jóvenes de la iglesia y graduados de la escuela, pues muchos anhelan continuar sus estudios universitarios, pero los costos solo en transportes son altos. Así es como los hermanos de Cor apoyan esta nueva etapa del programa. Cada padre y alumno debe firmar un convenio universitario o de escuela, en el cual se establecen las normas y criterios para mantener la beca. Este convenio tiene vigencia de un año. Según su récord, podrá continuar en el programa el año siguiente. Con el apoyo del personal docente y el pastor, la coordinadora supervisa y lleva un control sobre el rendimiento académico de cada alumno becado. También se les da un seguimiento en su formación espiritual a través de la asistencia de los padres y alumnos a los cultos de la iglesia, cumpliendo así con el objetivo principal de toda esta obra, que es llevar la palabra de Dios a cada persona. El programa por completo tiene una función muy importante para la iglesia local, pues tanto los padres como alumnos prestan un servicio como voluntarios en diferentes áreas y actividades de la iglesia. Cada actividad se organiza y socializa con los padres y alumnos. Todo esto con un plan de trabajo dirigido por el pastor y supervisado por la coordinadora. Se forman equipos de trabajo y se establecen fechas para cada actividad, entre ellas elaboración de merienda para los niños de escuela dominical, limpieza, restauración, Apoyo a trabajos de construcción en la iglesia, elaboración de alimentos para vender o comprar productos que la iglesia ofrezca. También los chicos tienen una forma muy bonita de comunicación con sus padrinos por medio de cartas y las visitas de patrocinadores en misión. Es muy emotivo y agradable ver su rostro de alegría al conocer sus padrinos. Contamos con la compañía de traductores para mejorar la relación y disfrutar mejor los almuerzos y tiempos compartidos. Todo esto con la ayuda de CUR y voluntarios del programa. Los alumnos de la escuela reciben cada año un paquete de útiles básicos y un uniforme de uso diario. También cuentan con el apoyo del personal docente para mejorar su rendimiento académico. Aunque no es por excelencia que los alumnos se mantienen en el programa, pero aún así, muchos de ellos son de los mejores alumnos de la institución, permaneciendo año tras año en el cuadro de honor. Por medio del programa, muchos padres, madres y jóvenes son servidores de la iglesia, pues han experimentado la gracia de Dios en sus vidas y encuentran en el servir una forma de agradecer a Dios por sus bondades. Dios ha alcanzado familias enteras a través de este hermoso programa y sus vidas han cambiado, pues ha cambiado también su forma de pensar y saber desde su propia experiencia que al que cree todo le es posible. Estamos cosechando frutos. El año anterior se graduó la primera universitaria, Florencia Barahona. Este año se gradúa otro más, Luis Fernando Moncada, y el próximo será Cindy Vanessa Montoya. Así que el programa está rindiendo frutos y los tres jóvenes se preparan para el área educativa. Y hay muchos más con ese objetivo, tanto de educación media como universitarios. La visión es que estos jóvenes puedan servir a su comunidad, a la iglesia, a la escuela, con conocimiento y la gracia de Dios en su vida, desde su propia experiencia vivida. Hay mucho más por hacer, pues la comunidad crece. La situación de desempleo en nuestro país ha provocado la mayor deserción escolar en la historia de Honduras. Eso repercutirá en las oportunidades de empleo a futuro y afectará más la economía. Es primordial mantenernos bajo la gracia de Dios, pues... Hay fe 
esperanza y amor en Él. Esto es importante para nosotros, agradecer primero a Dios, a la Iglesia de la Resurrección, a los patrocinadores por todo su amor y apoyo a la Iglesia, a la escuela y al programa de becas escolares y universitarias. Muchas gracias a los hombres y mujeres que desde la fundación de la escuela hasta el día de hoy siguen trabajando con el mundo. En el nombre de Jesucristo, sean benditas sus vidas. Muy bien. And let's hear, again, uh, be noting any questions you might have. Um, I'm going to pull up a video of a student. All right, so this is a student named uh, Luis, I believe. Inicié en el año 2015 a ser parte del programa de becas en el Colegio Juan Wesley. Eh, estudié dos años y me gradué en el 2016. En 2017, cuando me gradué, esperé tres meses, hice el examen de admisión de la universidad y empecé las clases en febrero del 2017. Trimestralmente se hace un presupuesto por periodo en donde se eh, colocan algunos costos de matrícula, materiales educativos y algunos manuales que nosotros necesitamos para poder, para, para poder seguir con los cursos en la universidad. Y también eh, hacemos un presupuesto para lo que es transporte. Y este presupuesto... Eh, Normalmente son unos 4,400 lempiras aproximadamente por periodo para cubrir estos costos. La beca se usa por medio de eh, los tres periodos. Se divide por cada periodo y se hace esa inversión. Se hace la gestión para que nosotros podamos eh, eh, seguir estudiando la carrera universitaria. De inicio, haber aprobado el examen de admisión o de selección de la universidad. Eh, también, eh, ya estando dentro del programa, eh, mantener eh, un índice mínimo del 70% en las clases en general y asistir también dos, al menos dos veces al culto de la iglesia, apoyar en algunas actividades a beneficio de la iglesia y también apoyar en algunas brigadas médicas de trabajo que vienen y que nosotros debemos de aportar como estudiantes. Ser agradecido con mucho de que nos apoyan en la educación Sin duda alguna, el apoyo ha sido muy importante, no solo en la parte económica, sino que ha sido un programa para poder impulsarnos a creer en nosotros mismos, a desarrollar nuestros propios talentos, nuestras habilidades y competencias. Y el programa ha, ha ayudado, ha sido mucho beneficio, ya que hemos crecido tanto de manera... de nuestras familias y, y también para nuestra formación en un nivel eh, universitario y, y superior.
continuar con mi formación académica, este, estudiando una maestría, eh, esa sería mi mayor satisfacción y también contribuir a, a, al Instituto Juan Buene porque ha sido muy importante en mi formación desde la colegiatura hasta la universidad y en conjunto con el programa de CORE eh, han apoyado mucho y pues creo que será muy importante para mí eh, devolver un poco a la comunidad, a los niños, dejar esa huella marcada de lo que pasó en mí también como experiencia y también contribuir a mi familia. Creo que sería una de las satisfacciones más grandes para mi vida, para, el, para la iglesia, para la institución y para el programa de becas universitarias. All right, and then we've got one last video by way of kind of introducing us to the school. And this is from a parent uh, named Alex. All right. Hola, eh, Dios les bendiga. Mi nombre es Alex Osorio. Pues quiero, verdad, contarles, verdad, cómo yo vine a los pies de Cristo, verdad, a la iglesia metodista. Eh, pues fue por el programa de becas COR, verdad. Nosotros los padres firmamos un convenio donde nos piden, pues, por lo menos asistir un, una vez al mes a un culto, verdad, de nuestra iglesia. Pero... Um, Habitualmente en ese momento quien asistía a la iglesia era mi esposa. Yo no, no asistía, ¿verdad? Pero ella estaba trabajando y me pidió que si yo lo podría hacer, ¿verdad? Venir a la iglesia. Porque tomaban asistencia, ¿verdad? En el programa de becas. Pues mi respuesta en ese momento fue no iré. Pues por lo consiguiente su respuesta hacia mí fue, me dijo pues nuestro hijo perderá la beca y tendremos que comprarle todo lo que la beca le provee. Pues fue así como accedí, venir a la iglesia, ¿verdad? Venía congojado, venía con pena, venía con vergüenza, ¿verdad? Pero eh, en la puerta estaban los ojeres de la iglesia, donde me abrazaron, me dieron la mano, me pasaron adelante, me ofrecieron donde sentarme, me hicieron sentir bienvenido. Eh, seguidamente, pues, en el transcurso del culto, ¿verdad?, que en ese entonces lo estaba dando el pastor Daniel Trujillo, ¿verdad?, pues, eh, la palabra que, que Dios tenía preparada ese día era especialmente para mí, porque recaía realmente todo lo que estaba pasando en mi vida, cómo estaba mi vida. Yo recuerdo que yo en algún momento me sentí quieto y me dieron ganas de salir corriendo porque la palabra era para mí, ¿verdad? Por medio del pastor Daniel. Yo tenía vergüenza y pena y me escondía mi rostro detrás, ¿verdad? Del hermano que estaba sentado, estaba sentado de, de, delante de mí para, pues, para luego... Um, Recibí, ¿verdad?, el culto. Me llamó la atención, ¿verdad? Porque recibí palabra, palabra de, cons de consuelo, palabra de amor y también de exhortación, ¿verdad? De lo que era mi vida en ese momento. Pues déjenme decirle de que decidí entregarle mi vida a Cristo, ¿verdad? Y pues hasta hoy tenemos ya pues Cinco años, ¿verdad?, de servirle, ¿verdad?, a nuestro padre. Y es un gran honor y privilegio para mí poderle servir, ¿verdad?, y pertenecer, ¿verdad?, a la familia metodista. Y, pues, ¿qué le podré decir? Las bendiciones han venido como viento en popa, podríamos decirlo, ¿verdad? Mi vida cambió. Ah, traje, Dios trajo paz en mi hogar. Trajo bendición para mis hijos, trajo bendición para mi familia, pero ante todo, trajo bendición para nuestra vida, ¿verdad? 
Y con esto, pues, decirle verdad de que Cristian Cristian Osorio es mi hijo mayor. Él este año se gradúa, ¿verdad? Con la ayuda de Dios y con el apoyo que ustedes también me le han brindado, pues, él el, el otro año seguirá en la universidad, primero Dios. Pues mi hija también goza de una beca, ¿verdad? Y ella, eh, pues, está en décimo. Y así, pues, sucesivamente está mi hijo pequeño, ¿verdad? El de ocho años que él va a tercero también, él goza con una beca, ¿verdad?, que, que Dios me le proveó por medio de ustedes. Y pues, ¿qué? Déjenme contarles que la bendición no, no paró ahí, ¿verdad? Déjenme contarles que de la misión fui tomado en cuenta también, ¿verdad?, para, para suplir la vacante que se necesitaba de guardia aquí en el colegio. Pues tenemos un año ya de estar laborando, ¿verdad? Aquí en el colegio y esperamos, ¿verdad? Seguir laborando primeramente Dios con la ayuda de él, ¿verdad? Y con el apoyo de ustedes. Pues eh, es un, este trabajo es mi sustento, ¿verdad? Para mi familia, ¿verdad? Gracias, yo le doy gracias, ¿verdad? Primeramente a Dios y luego a ustedes, porque ustedes son instrumentos, ¿verdad? Usados por Dios. Gracias porque... Eh, gracias a ustedes, este, esta escuela y colegio es una realidad y sirve de bendición para nuestra vida. Una educación de calidad para nuestros hijos, ¿verdad? Eh, y así mismo también, ¿verdad? Gracias a, a mi pastor Héctor Laínez, mi guía, ¿verdad? Eh, un gran pastor, un gran ser humano, eh, una persona muy importante, ¿verdad? En nuestras vidas también, ¿verdad? que él sigue también con el proyecto, ¿verdad? Él, pues, está en todo momento un hombre entregado, ¿verdad, Dios? En todo momento. Y, pues, que pedirle, ¿verdad?, que oremos por, por nuestro pastor, ¿verdad? Para que sea Dios, ¿verdad?, el que siga guiando, ¿verdad?, su vida. ¿verdad? Gracias nuevamente. Eh, con, déjeme decirles que estoy eternamente agradecido. Y... Espero que Dios bendiga la, la vida de cada uno de ustedes. Gracias. Wonderful. So after hearing kind of an overview, a word from a student, a word from a parent, um, are there any are there any particular questions? Remember, we have uh, Cheryl McMorris who's with us on the call and. Um, and Callie Williams also, who we heard a couple nights ago, is uh, teaching, if, if I have that right, at the One Wester School uh, right now. And so, um, anyway, any questions or comments that you might have? Um, so Jean is asking the cost uh, to sponsor a student for a year. And Cheryl, would you like to talk a little bit about the sponsorship program? Sure. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about it later, but I'll get this part talked about now. So then later when I go on and on about my stories, then I'll have more time for those. So um, there's the program is a two, two tiered program. Uh, many of you may or may not be uh, familiar with the Compassion International program. It's a sponsor program. It's very large. Um, and then there's various other sponsor programs. So in order to stay in the market and comparable with their program, we have the classic sponsorship and that cost is $39.50 a month. So that's $474 a year. And then um, at Juan Wesley, that the average cost per student is actually more than that amount. Um, but again, we have that amount so that we can stay competitive with all the other programs that we have available to us um, and it covers about 80% of the average cost per student. So we also have a premium sponsorship and that one is $47.50 a month. And that um, helps bridge that gap between the two. And it averages out to, e to equal the average amount of one student to go to Wadden Wesley because the younger kids pay less than the older kids just for the materials and the teaching and the programs and all of that. So it's all based on averages. 
Uh, and that $47.50 a month, just to give you an idea, annually is $570. So it's a $474 for the classic, $570 for the premium sponsorship. And those can be paid once a year or they can be paid monthly. And those can be done online or if you are one who likes to use checks and um, are timid about using digital, that happens, um, that's easily, easily done as well. So Cheryl, a couple of questions here. Um, what ages does the school cover and about how many students are there right now? So the ages go from preschool, so around, you know, three, four years old, um, and then kindergartens, fifth, you know, usually ages age from five, and then you age into six, and it goes all the way up through high school. So, and then as well, um, those graduates, those that graduate from high school are also available to continue their sponsorship with the same sponsor if that, um, if the sponsor is willing to continue sponsoring through university. So, um, yeah, so I guess from preschool through university. <laughs> and it's the same amount, whether it's um, university sponsorships are the same. Um, it's just a continuation because what we were finding is that our graduates from the Juan Wesley School were, um, there was a challenge of meeting the cost to go to the school. It's a state-run uh, program, so it's technically free school, but it's a two-hour bus ride and or taxi ride, and the cost of that transportation is approximately the cost of the sponsorship. So with our sponsorships, they are able to actually get to the school. Occasionally they have just a little bit left over um, in their budgeted amount like Luis was talking about where it might buy them uh, some books or some copies. Um, they do a lot of copying as opposed to uh, like printing and as opposed to buying whole books. But um, sometimes it covers some of that and, but usually uh, they do have some costs that come out of their pockets for, for various, depending on the program, of course. About, do you remember how, about how many students are at the oh. one Wesley School right now? Well, um, it has a capacity of about 350. Um, with the COVID, the um, enrollment is down. And Callie, do you have that number right offhand? I don't have an exact number, but I believe it's around 200, 250. That sounds about right. That sounds about right. Yeah. So right now, um, you know, like everybody else that's really struggling with the effects of the pandemic. And then of course, um, I think we've already heard a little bit about um, how that's affecting Honduras specifically. It's also affecting the Juan Wesley School. So we are um, really hoping to help them out with that. And um, one way that we're trying to bridge that gap is we also offer uh, classroom sponsorships, because student sponsorships, you commit to writing the student, your sponsored student twice a year. And, but if you believe in the program, you think it's fantastic, you like to keep plugged in, but you really are not much of a letter writer, like you don't really want to have that obligation, that works perfect for our classroom sponsors. And as a classroom sponsor, you still get updates on the school um, and you also get the teachers have uh, committed to write a little little newsletter to about the class so you can sponsor a particular grade. And um, I'll share one of those examples a little bit later. So Cheryl, the questions are coming in. They're good ones. Um, awesome. Yeah, so uh, Jean asks if the One Wesley School has any contact or like connection to any other Methodist schools in Latin America, or are there any other Methodist? I mean, I guess in Latin America, I know there are, but are there any other connections to other schools like that? I believe that we are the one, the only one of its kind in Honduras. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's talk of any more, or we're still kind of trying to iron out the break-even point with the sponsorships and and all of that. So yeah, right now we we're it. <laughs> And then do the sponsored students, um, do they have to work or do anything at the school uh, kind of in exchange for their scholarship? 
Yep. Um, that's an excellent question. So the sponsored kids do have to uh, sign an agreement, them and their parents. And there are some requirements to be in the program. <sighs> One of them is to meet minimum grade point average of 70% and above. That's the all through Juan Wesley, as well as the university students. So, um, you know, you don't, nobody wants to sponsor a kid who thinks that, uh, oh, that just makes it real easy and I don't have to do anything. Um, it's actually the opposite. A lot of those kids work harder because they are getting sponsored. Um, and so they have to meet the minimum minimum um, grade point average. And then as well, they um, um, are obligated to serve. So the church has various serve opportunities for both the students and the parents. Um, currently, you know, we are always kind of fluctuating a little bit different, you know, as we go and develop and trying to solve for challenges. But right now, um, they are required to attend the church. I think it's twice a month. Um, it was once a month. And so um, that's one of those moving parts sometimes. And part of that is not just to expose them to um, Christ and the living the life of Christ as this is a faith-based program, but also it's a good time to meet with the sponsored group so that you can kind of give updates and talk to the parents and give them you know, guidelines of what they need to do. So everybody pitches in and they help with things like um, planting trees or flowers or bushes or doing work around um, painting. A lot of times it's the sponsored kids and their parents who will come and help when the mission teams go uh, to that school. Um, the college, the university students are a tremendous help and they love to do it. So it works out perfect but they are always um, obliged very willingly and they come and help any of the medical mission teams that are there um, as well as um, regular mission teams. So they are um, obligated to do that and, and write letters to their sponsors twice a year. And we pick twice a year, it's a nice round number um, and easy to commit to. And we also have, typically will have a mission team that goes down since you all may or may not know that there's not a postal system like here. So we can't like mail them all down there. So they are taken down physically with um, mission teams that go down there and as well when the letters come back. So I coordinate with Amanda who did that video. And so she gets letters from all the kids gathered up and brought back this way. And then I send out communication and gather letters from sponsors to be sent down there and then they all get translated that need to so you don't have to worry about translating any of that <laughs> so how many teachers are at the school and uh someone asked also if, if the teachers are teaching online uh during the pandemic like so many of our teachers are right now um i'll let kelly address that one uh, well, I'm Callie Williams. I am one of two English teachers at Juan Wesley this year. We currently have around 10 teachers um, and we are all online. So we teach on WhatsApp because most of our students have no access to Zoom. They have no access to Google Classrooms or anything. So they buy a WhatsApp package for around 25 one peer a month or uh, a day. It's about $1 and they have access to WhatsApp for the entire day. That means they can download pictures, videos, and things like that. So we send our classes through WhatsApp. We receive homework through WhatsApp. And so when we think of online school in the United States, it's a bit different, but we are getting the job done. That's awesome. Let's see. So, uh, Someone asked about, again, about sponsors. Uh, do they contract for longer than a year? Or how, uh, Cheryl, do you, you know, kind of keep things going uh, if a sponsor can't keep up their sponsorship from year to year? How do the kids get supported? You know, talk a little about that. Yeah. Um, so it, the sponsorship is as long as you want it to. So if you... Um, sign up to be a sponsor, 
and you have a uh, what used to be EFT, now it's monthly payments that are done online. You, um, so if you do that, then it's ongoing until you send us an email that says, I'm going to need to discontinue. You don't have to tell me why, uh, but you know, you may need to discontinue. So um, if you do it annually, um, we, of course, if you possibly can love the monthly because annually we have to then go out and reach out to everybody to see if they want to continue. And if they don't, then that's fine. Um, whereas monthly, if you don't, you just say, I'm, I'm ready to quit. And so it's not it's not riskier one way. It's not riskier to do it monthly. It's just, it helps you um, as well because a lot of times that you do wanna continue and then you forget. If you've got a pile of things that need to be done like I do, that's the type of thing that ends up in the middle and I kind of forget about it. So it's as long as you want to. Um, now, if you say, if you can't keep up with it, um, all the time, like I'm not sure what you mean, whether you want to like do it one year, not a year in the next year, that's certainly possible. Um, if you decide that you're unable to keep going, um, then you can just end whenever, whenever you want. I, did that answer the question as you understood it, Andy? I think so. And I think maybe the question was a little more on even a organizational level. You know, if you have sponsors dropping in and out, how are the students able to continue their studies? Okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so um, the way that we have it set up now, and this is another thing that's kind of developed over time, and this is where it's at now, which I think works really good, um, is that we commit, we as Church of the Resurrection, so um, just back up a second, I'm actually a volunteer, um, I'm not on the actual staff at Church of the Resurrection, but I'm the volunteer that coordinates the program. We like to have most of the, as all of you guys, ministries being lay led. Um, so I just had a mind blank. Oh, the, so you're feeling it. Okay, so we have um, committed to 100, <coughs> to be able to sponsor 100 students. So currently I have 95, I have a handful of students that do not have sponsors. However, Church of Resurrection is subsidizing these spots because it's, it's like here you can jump in and out of school or maybe change schools. And that's really difficult in Honduras to be able to keep your school and not lose the year. So um, we really kind of need to, to set it at the beginning of the school year in February so that a student knows whether they can start. So currently we have five openings for that. And that, I say it's being subsidized um, more through classroom sponsorships until they get a personal sponsor. So um, I have this big old spreadsheet and I've got all the students and their ages and their grades and I've got all the sponsors and I match them up based on either a preference um, or if they say they don't care, then I match them up with somebody that's available. And so then you get um, the name of the student and profile of them that just gives kind of a rundown of, of them. And then um, those are the ones that you get to write every year, uh, twice a year. And we also try uh, to do some Zoom. If we have like, for instance, a virtual mission trip like this, at the end of our virtual mission trip and at the beginning, um, if there is a sponsor, if one of the mission virtual mission trip participants is a sponsor, we will offer for them to be able to Zoom with their sponsored student um, through the Zoom. And so they go off into a chat room with a translator if they need one. And uh, so they do that. Um, and now if a sponsor drops out, that doesn't mean that the student is left high and dry. That just means that they don't have anybody to um, correspond with um, until another sponsor comes along and, um, and builds a relationship with them. Great. I think it's one last question and then we'll talk about a break and what will come after the break. So the question is about you know, the kids who are accepted into the school. Um, are, uh, are they already Methodist? Are they of various faith backgrounds or uh, maybe speak to that? Yeah, um, they are not 
Methodist necessarily. Some of them might be, some of them might. So um, the Methodist, the Juan Wesley School began as a church and that's the only Methodist church in the area. So, and then they had all of these classrooms available during the week when there wasn't Sunday school. And um, that was kind of a beginning of, hey, let's let's have a school, let's use this, this classroom and have a faith-based school. So, um, so some of the some of the kids at the school um, are members of the church. Many of them are not. A lot of them are go to other churches in the area, and that's okay. And so if they want to be a sponsored student, uh, be one of those 100 sponsored students, then they need to apply, and they are vetted um, by Amanda and the pastor there. Um, and so it's based on need. We don't want, um, it's not just, um, in fact, we try not to look at the, it's not a scholarship where they're really smart. So we're gonna sponsor them. That's not how it starts. Um, we hope that when they come in, they improve their, their education as an improvement, which what we have heard from the public schools versus the Juan Wesley School, that it is a more rigorous program. So, um, so we don't expect for them to all be um, on the honor roll. Um, many of them do, like I said, because they work harder. And um, if they are not able to progress um, to a satisfactory level of the 70%, then um, they are released from the program. Um, or, yeah, due to, and they are, now trust me when I say they are giving, given plenty of chance. They're given special opportunities special, you know, teachers working with them on a special basis, uh, they are giving plenty of opportunities to succeed. So oftentimes those that are um, unable to stay in the program due to grades, it is um, really their own doing. Okay, very good. Thanks, thanks Cheryl, and thanks for the good questions. So let's regather, and as we come back together, Again, we'll begin with one more culture moment. Um, so Milton Yovares, who we met last night, has been uh, pulling together and sharing these culture moments just to help us get a, a better feel for Honduras, the country. Um, Milton, I, I saw the theme for tonight. Do you wanna offer any kind of initial word uh, or explanation about um, about tonight's culture moment before we play? Um, not really, maybe after, if there's any questions, I may have something. Um, the video, it's kind of like very self-explanatory also. Okay. So, um, and I'm actually also learning through it because um, I took advantage and started like um, making research and, and also learn about the culture as a local okay well very good well so maybe just as a, a very quick word i think um uh tonight's video at least begins focusing on um on a Hon honduran people who are of african descent and it just underscores uh, something that uh, roberto pena the mission superintendent said to us on the first night and that is that they're um are a variety of people groups that make up uh, the, the people of Honduras. Um, they're not a monolith. Um, and, and so there's, there's a rich diversity of people that all call the country home. And so this will, I think, give us a glimpse into one of those. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm Faida, and today we're going to be talking about the African diaspora in Honduras, more specifically the Garifuna people. Freedom. Let me start by saying that in today's video we'll be talking about a distinct ethnic group called the Garifuna. There are Garifuna populations all over Central and North America, but for the purposes of this video, we'll be focusing in particular on the Garifuna community in Honduras. So let's get started. The Garifuna community are an ethnic group dispersed across Central America, the United States and Canada. 
Their total population currently stands at 300,000. The biggest settlement resides in the United States, where to a certain degree they are absorbed under the vast and infinitely diverse umbrella term African American. The second largest Garifuna population can be found in Honduras, with small but significant concentrations in Guatemala, Nicaragua and Belize. Honduras has a population of 9.3 million, of which 100,000 people are Garifuna. The Garifuna across the diaspora speak the local languages of the countries in which they live. In Guatemala, Nicaragua and Honduras, they speak Spanish, and they speak English in Belize, the United States and Canada. The correct plural term for the Garifuna people is Garinagu. The word Garifuna refers to a single person, the language and the culture. However, in spite of this, the Garinagu are widely referred to as the Garifuna. Within Honduras, only two Afro-Honduran communities are regarded as being distinct ethnic groups. Those are the Garifuna and the Bay Island Creoles. The Bay Island Creole communities speak English and remain separate from their Spanish-speaking compatriots of the Honduran mainland. The Garifuna are the largest ethnic minority in the country. There are 36 Garifuna communities in Honduras and 10 settlements. There are significant Garifuna populations on the island of Roatan, the coastal city of Trujillo, and in coastal villages which stretch beyond Honduras, spanning from Nicaragua to Belize. The Garifuna speak their own dialect amongst themselves, which is derived from several Bantu languages, Arawak, Carib, Spanish, French and English. Interestingly, the Garifuna language features terms that can only be spoken by men and others that can be spoken by women. In 1635, two slave ships trafficking West Africans were shipwrecked on the coast of the Caribbean island of St. Vincent. The island was already inhabited by the Arawak and the Red Carib indigenous populations who had previously colonized the island. The West Africans from the shipwreck integrated with the locals and were referred to as Black Caribs, adopting the Carib language but maintaining many of their African customs. These mixed people of Arawak, Carib and West African origin came to be known as the Garifuna. The British attempted to claim the island as a colonial possession, but the Garifuna revolted, led by Chief Joseph Chateauier, also known as Satouye. He was ultimately killed in battle and became the first Garifuna hero. The Garifuna resisted European rule so persistently and for so long that in 1797, the British forcibly deported 5,000 Garifuna to Honduras in Central America, where they largely settled on the nearby island of Roatan. A smaller number founded villages throughout the Atlantic coastline of Central America as their population expanded. A notable figure worthy of mention is Thomas Vincent Ramos, who founded Garifuna settlements in Belize and was a fierce activist for Garifuna rights. The Garifuna today largely work in fishing and farming. Tapado and machuca are some of their most distinguished dishes. Gifiti is a classic Garifuna alcoholic beverage made from rum, roots and mixed herbs. Music and dance is a big part of their African cultural heritage. The best known genre of Garifuna music and dance is punta, which is characterized by heavy drumming and gyrating of the hips. In 2001, UNESCO declared Garifuna culture in Honduras, Belize, Guatemala and Nicaragua a masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity. In 2006, Garifuna artist Aurelio Martinez became the first black member of the Honduran National Congress. However, the Garifuna in Honduras still find themselves politically marginalized and increasingly deprived of their land rights, with authorities exploiting legal loopholes to make lucrative deals with companies and private individuals seeking to build on Garifuna ancestral land. There is also a disproportionately low level of education among the Garifuna, with a 2000 in an eight report concluding that only 17% of Garifuna finish high school and only 3% enroll in university. Every year on the 12th of April, the Garifuna on the island of Roatan celebrate the anniversary of the day they first arrived on the island and created their settlement. The Garifuna are proud of their African heritage and treasure their traditions which have been passed down the generations. Freedom. So yeah, so, um, well, first of all, I, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and learned um, a little bit from it. And of course, um, like I've been saying um, the, the nights before, there's a whole lot to learn about um, the culture 
in in Honduras, that's just like a small percent of what it really is among the whole country. Um, but I think personally, I've always um, liked to learn um, from the Garifuna culture, and there's a lot of um, miss. I don't know if if it's misunderstanding, but um, like we all generalize, like if we see a black person, then we say it's Garifuna just because it's black, but it's not. Sometimes, I mean, it could be, but sometimes it doesn't. So learning all the differences between um, the culture and, and kind of like um, learning about it, it's really interesting and, and it's, it's a really rich culture. So, and they make a lot of good food. <laughs> <laughs> so. But you can Google it and, and learn more, more about it. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. All right, so let's turn it back to Cheryl for a few more minutes. Cheryl, I know you uh, have some other words to share about ways to support the school. And I think some, some letters um, maybe to share from some of the students and folks associated with the school. I do, I have both of those. And so um, when we get letters from the school to the sponsors, um, I get to, to know what they all say. So I think that's really super fun. Um, Callie used to, till she moved down to Honduras, she was my A number one translator helper. She did the lion's share of the translating. Um, and then I take what, what I get and as we read through those, and find um, bits that like I find funny or interesting, I compile them into a, a newsletter. So when I then those letters get mailed to the sponsors, classroom sponsors, as well as the student sponsors, and they get mailed along with what I call it's a cover letter, but it's like a newsletter with a little conglomeration of some quotes from the letters. So I am going to read from one of the latest um, or the latest one that was in February when we got letters back. When Callie got dropped off down there in Honduras, her, her dad brought back letters for us. So here's a few little um, quotes from those that I found touching, interesting. Some of them kind of kind of make me verklempt a little bit. Um, so the first one I see on here, um, Majority of the kids, when they talked about um, COVID and how it's influencing um, or affecting their lives, so many of them really enjoyed the extra time with their family. Although, you know, they don't like the, the threats and the, and the scares of it all, but most of them talked about how great it's been to spend more time with their family. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so Caesar is a 10th grader and he writes very fondly about his family. He says, my family always supports me and they are there for me because they are my life. My brother is a big supporter for me because he teaches me many things and helps me with my homework. He is also still studying in order to improve himself. And so we can have a good life. My dad is very loving with us. He and my whole family go to the church and he is the one that supports my studies financially. Uh, my mom is very special because she works and afterwards she comes home to make the cheese and the meals. I love her a lot. And I thought that was really sweet for a 10th grader to talk so kindly about his parents. Um, so we, I had mentioned about um, the virtual mission trips and talking with the sponsor kids. So after that was in November, so this letter came in February. And Onias, who's in eighth grade now, he writes to his sponsor, and in it he says, I really enjoyed talking with you on Zoom. It's been a long time since I saw you, and it was very special. I was very nervous, but I loved it. Um, go on to Kendra. So Kendra is a, just a little third grader, and so her sister helped her, or basically wrote the letter, to the sponsor and her sister wrote, um, Kenda really liked reading your letter and seeing the photos that you sent her and printed. And she printed them in order to put them in the family album. She likes to see the beautiful pictures of your grandkids and says that they are very pretty. So um, she was lucky enough to be able to meet that sponsor. And so she considers her sponsor a part of her family. 
Um, Hugo is in seventh grade and happens to be Callie's sponsored child. Callie would sponsor all 100 of them if she could. But so she um, has got Hugo at the moment. And he says, I like it when you, this is for the letters, of course. I like it when you tell me in your letters that I am a hero and that you are proud of me. I hope not to disappoint you in this new stage of my life or new stage in my studies, which is my first year of junior high school, so seventh grade, which will be harder. Um, so, you know, you wonder, do my letters mean anything to them? Absolutely. There's, there's one response about it right there. So there is uh, Cindy, who is um, in 12th grade. So, um, yeah, she's getting ready to graduate. And um, her, what she said, so Cindy has been in and out of school due to, she has encephalitis. And so sometimes there'll be periods to where she has such a headache and she can't go to school and the, you know, she's told she has to stay home and, and rest and relax. So, but she, um, she's been working really hard and she still does very well in school in spite of missing it. And so she wrote, so writes to her sponsor and says, my big dream is to be able to graduate from college to be a doctor. Regardless of the obstacles, I will keep moving forward. These days I have been focusing a lot on the suffering people. I want to be able to grow up very quickly so that I can help people who need me because I know that I can do everything in Christ who strengthens me. It will be an honor to help them someday. So um, the sponsorship is helping her go to school and she has developed a heart to help others because of her own ailments. Um, one of my favorite quotes is from um, Helen and um, Helen just graduated just this past the end of last year. Um, and she wrote, um, so Helen has always lived with her grandma and her, um, her dad left and abandoned her and her mom when she was very young. And then her mom, I don't know exactly what the story is, but basically she's lived with her grandma for the majority of her life. And so Helen says, I am very happy because I could talk to my dad and he asked for my forgiveness for abandoning me. And he was my escort at my graduation, and my grandma was my other escort. And that just really touched my heart because I know that uh, he had left when he was when she was very young. Um, so that was the uh, all the quotes. I have two small little stories. Oh, I have one, and Kelly's got one. So um, we have a little girl, or had. We have her, but last year she started school. And this is, um, you know, when they, so they started and they went to school through mid-March, so February, a month and a half. And then they said, COVID, y'all go home. So um, she, uh, Brendy is her name, and she was a little first grader and she didn't know how to read because she was in first grade. She hadn't learned yet. Um, unfortunately, her mom is illiterate. And so her mom is unable to help her with her homework. So uh, homeschooling requires, you may or may not know, but it requires quite a bit of guidance from parents many times, especially as a first grader trying to read and her mom wasn't able to um, help her. And so uh, she started out actually a little bit behind the other first graders. So she never really was able to keep up with them. And her mom came to the decision that, um, you know, the money that it takes to get the WhatsApp package, although Brandy is sponsored to go to the school, they still have to come up with money to get the WhatsApp package to get their assignments and turn them in. And that money um, could be better spent elsewhere since it really wasn't helping her because the mom, she couldn't help her. Um, so anyway, um, that went on for a little while and they decided that she's going to pull her out. And so he said, look, if we're able to we will hold a spot for her for next year so that she can come back um, if we can work out for her to get caught up. So through some kind of brainstorming-esque um, process, we came up with one of the sponsored university students, her name is Cindy. She is getting ready to graduate with a, an education degree in June, I think, um, May or June. 
And so we said, Cindy, for your serving time, you know how they all have to, to serve um, for your serving time. You, and she also lives somewhat close to Brendy and you're to use your education degree. Can you go and tutor Brendy over the, the Christmas break? So it's in between the two school years and get her caught up so that she can start first grade again and she can learn to read. Well, she did it. She got caught up. And so she was, we were able to figure out, actually secretary of the school was able to, there was a system glitch and they, the government was saying that she couldn't repeat first grade, but anyway, it was all worked out. And so, um, but she also kept sponsor or tutoring her, um, which worked out good because Cindy, because she is a university student was able to use her sponsor money since they're not transportation, they use it for the internet. So she had some internet. Brendy could come over, her mom committed to bringing her over. Um, she could do her homework and turn it in through Cindy's internet that she got through her sponsor program. Um, so then that also helps the mother with the WhatsApp package and that. But um, so they did that and she started school and she was doing really good. And I just got a note, I don't know, within the last week maybe, that Brendy has got a um, grade point average of 96%, and she's doing really well in her classes. And so, um, so yeah. So that's my story for um, that, that um, reflects what the sponsor program, how a sponsor program can help the kids in their education and change their life. Callie has um, a little something that she would also like to share with you if you wanna do that, Callie. Yes, I can do mine quickly. Um, Cheryl was talking about how the letters and the sponsorships mean a lot to the students. Um, and so I wanted to talk about one of my students, Kevin, who is in seventh grade. And when Kevin was in around third, second or third grade, he was going to get kicked out of the sponsorship program because there was no one to sponsor him. This was back when our system was not in place that if someone wasn't sponsoring him, he could not continue on in the program. And somebody, a lady named Susan Bamford came on a trip and she started to play with Kevin and decided that she wanted to sponsor him. And Kevin was very lazy. I, want, I don't want to say lazy, but Kevin's a little bit lazy. But the minute that he got Susan as his sponsor, he started to turn things around and he loved Susan so much. I remember reading Kevin, Kevin's letters to Susan and it was just the sweetest relationship I've ever seen. Um, but unfortunately last year, Susan passed away and Susan's husband um, continued on with the sponsorship, but sweet little Kevin, well, he says, you know, Susan is still with me. He, her, his mom tells me pretty frequently, you know, Susan is still with me and Susan will always be with me. Um, he's one of my English course students. I offer an English course to some students, but he, we, one of our projects is to have a pen pal. And Kevin told me, I want to write my letter to Susan, which is his sponsor who passed away. And so I think that is just an example of, you know, no matter what happens to you, your students care about you so much and will continue to carry a, care about you forever. And so Kevin wrote his letter to Susan and I am hoping that his, her husband will respond to him, but yeah, he, your students will love you and they will love you forever. And I uh, was going to share due to time, I'm not going to do any more because I could go on forever. But um, there is the, the teachers, uh, if you want to be a classroom sponsor or say that we fill up the rest of the student sponsor slots and then you want to still stay plugged in, you do get the newsletter with all the quotes from the students, the ones that I thought were touching or funny or whatever. Um, and um, then I have a letter that I was going to share, but I'm not. And it's from all the teachers uh, two or three times a year, depending on how we can coordinate. Um, they do send just updates on the class and what they're learning. And then some pictures of some kids in class and their projects. And that's sometimes pretty cute to see, um, to see those. So. Great. Thank you, Cheryl and Callie both. Uh, this has been a, a rich evening and 
Um, uh, Cheryl, could you one more time drop your contact email in the chat so that if people are interested in following up with you um, to learn more, to explore sponsorship uh, in particular, they can do that. Um, I will. I'm going to put two things in the chat. I'll put my email, which, the, well, the email I use, it's the through the church. We have a one for the sponsor program, and that pretty much goes to me, um, or I'm the one that, that monitors it, as well as the website link. If you just want to go look on there, um, now just forewarn that there is a few updates that need to happen on that site. Oops, that was the wrong one. Oh, yeah, there it is. So here, right there, I sent that. So the program is administered through Church of the Resurrection, but it is not a Church of the Resurrection program. It is throughout, um, you know, open. We have sponsors from all different churches. Andy Lewis, for example, is one of them. Um, and so also that that link is on the UMVIM Honduras website. I've shared that link with um, Milton. And so if you're if you forget where you put this, you can either go through their website. I find that my that Church of the Resurrection's website is kind of difficult to maneuver just because it's very involved. So uh, you can get there a couple of ways and that you can read just a little bit. And uh, there's a link to what's called push pay and they are tax deductible. So you will get a statement of your donation at the end of the year from Church of the Resurrection so that you can uh, use that for tax deduction if you so wish. Now you don't have to pay the specific amounts you can pay Say, you know, you want to have a tax deduction of X amount of dollars at the end of the year, you could certainly do that. Um, you could, some people have one sponsor, one, some people have two sponsors. We've got um, a couple of team sponsorships, some young kids that can't afford the full one, but they'll be, they'll team up with two or three others to where it's, you know, like $15 a month for each of them. And um, so we can do that too. We work with you however we can to make it work. Uh, so my um, HN sponsorship, HN sponsorship at core.org is the email if you have any questions at all. HN sponsorship at core.org. Yeah. Uh, so there's that if you have any questions. Um, and I'll get back to you on that when, you know, with your answers. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, it is, we're, we're about out of time. However, um, I did wanna give uh, Tom Bryan, even, even if it's just four or five minutes, the opportunity to make us aware of another um, just inspiring, a longstanding ministry that has Methodist roots um, in Honduras that you may want to know about. And it also has North Texas conference uh, roots. So, uh, Tom, can you give us just your elevator speech about Send Hope and uh, the host sacks and what's going on there? And as you do, I'm going to put uh, the link to a web page on our North Texas Conference website where you can find um, links and more information about what Tom's talking about. So this will just be an introduction and a snapshot. And if you want to hear more, contact me and I can put you in touch with Tom or others. So Tom, you, could you share for just a few minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, so I started going to Honduras in 1991 before the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church was a part of Honduras. And um, I asked Andy when uh, the United Methodist Church came to Honduras, he, he thinks around 2000 uh, after October 98 when Mitch hit. So I started going down there. Uh, I'm a retired dentist in Allen. Started going down there when I was still in practice just to pull teeth. And um, I, uh, I worked, I went to the Portland Pier, which is on the far eastern coast of Honduras. Um, and it's called the Mosquito Coast or La Mosquitia. It's named after the Mosquito people, M-I-S-K-I-T-O, Miskito, not the, not the insect. So um, I started going there in 91 and, and started going every six weeks to make these trips, uh, dental, medical and dental trips. And we would get in a boat and go way back into the interior or in a pickup truck and uh, drive or an eight hour drive or six hour drive and basically camp out. We would sleep in uh, mosquito tents and work in a church or a clinic there 
on the Rio Coco or the Cruta River or uh, back inland uh, in Mocaron or and those other Bruce Roos or the other areas, uh, villages uh, in, in the Mesquita area. Started bringing kids back in 1995 to Texas Scottish Rite for Children for orthopedic treatment. And the first boy we brought back, they fused his thigh to his hip because his leg was uh, infected and, and uh, yeah, the joint was so badly destroyed that he couldn't, they fused them together so he didn't have a movable hip, hip joint, couldn't do the kind of work that they need to do over there to support themselves, which is basically substance farming. So um, we thought education was the answer and we were trying to get him educated uh, in Port Lumpere, his, his village, which is uh, La Catabila, was across the Laguna and he had to come over to the to the main city to go to the seventh grade and I went down and because there's no electricity and running water in most of the little villages, Port Lumpur is the only town uh, in Calcutta across the Laguna, the only towns that have electricity at night. So um, this boy's name was Walter and we uh, I went down and Walter wasn't passing when he came over to Port Lumpur he was living with I was paying his aunt to room and board him and, he, and his aunt wouldn't even be there and Walter wasn't passing Spanish or mouth. So God gave me a vision for a children's home. I'm not sure why he gave a dentist a vision for a children's home because I knew nothing about children's homes, but we opened a children's home in 2005 and um, we house about 47 kids there. We also, that's called the House of Hope and uh, a young couple from my church uh, Stephen and Lauren Hozak from the First Methodist in Allen now live there and oversee the children's home. We also have the School of Hope with grades one through six. We send containers down to Honduras. I've sent, we, we just loaded one Monday. We use Dole fruit containers and uh, it's it will arrive and it will, it will leave <laughs> next Monday and arrive in, uh, oh, there's, there are the Hozaks. Uh, this is before they had their own two children. They've got two kids of their own now. Um, so um, we, uh, we've packed Kids Against Hunger food, and we've done that uh, at Christ United Methodist with uh, one of the pastors gathered there. We also do it with their confirmation class. We pack it at my church on Change the World in May, and we pack every Saturday at my house. When the pandemic hit, there was a... Uh, uh, that, well, when the pandemic hit, they didn't, they, they didn't have any school, so they missed a whole year of school. And then when the, the two hurricanes hit in, in November, we wiped out all the crops. So the people over there were, were starving because there was no food. And, there, you know, here in Allen, we have three food pantries. Well, there are not any food pantries in, in Port Lumpur. And the government sent some rice and beans over finally. But the only people that was given out food was uh, was uh, Send Hope at, at the House of Hope. We have a feeding program. We're feeding over a thousand kids a meal every day, and um, so um, we started packing this food in my storage building here at my house. And we did that every Saturday from April of last year, and we're still doing it. We're doing the Rotary Club uh, this next Saturday here at my house. So that's kind of an overview of it. Uh, we had a PowerPoint that I can uh, talk more about, but I, mean, I can give me th things to say when I see the picture, but I know we're out of time. Tom, thanks so much. I, I mean, I know this your story, the story of uh, Stephen and Laura, uh, who started going to the House of Hope as uh, youth group kids and now uh, are there as missionaries um, is inspiring. And the ministry y'all do is amazing. I just wanted people to at least make the connection. And friends, if you want to learn more about that ministry, again, which started out of the North Texas Conference, um, connect with me or Tom Bryan. We'd love to love for you to learn more about it. Um, so I, I see some messages in the chat. Uh, this has been a great virtual trip, four nights. Uh, thanks to each of you, especially, again, uh, our marathoners who uh, were here for all four nights. Um, you'll hear from me in a week or so uh, with some follow-up. I mean, mainly just to get your evaluations and, um, and, and to see if there are ways you want to connect. Um, so you'll hear from me again. Um, but on behalf of, uh, of the mission staff, and I see Milton still here. I'll let him say the final word. 
Um, thanks for being a part of this trip and for um, being introduced to this great mission. I hope it's not the last time that, uh, that you uh, take a trip of one kind or another and connect with our uh, United Methodist friends in Honduras. Milton, do you want to say the, a closing word? Sure. Um, I was actually just doing that on the chat. Um, just appreciating you all for joining us uh, this week. Um, I know you have lots of options to be doing every evening, but you decided to be with us and learn about the, the mission in Honduras, what we do, um, how we connect um, in the different programs that we have and who we partner with and all the, the ministry that's going on, um, especially in these difficult times. Um, but you still are there. So thank you very much for your support. And um, I'm still uh, available for any type of communication uh, through Andy or um, directly for um, volunteer teams and, 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 and et cetera. But um, just want to say thank you very much. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it and learned a lot and Looking forward to, to meeting you in person, hopefully soon. Wonderful. Thanks, Milton. God bless you all. Have a good night. Adios. Bye-bye.